I've been reviewing video games for a number of years now, and I've come to realize that bland games are by far the hardest to review. A game can be completely terrible, but as long as it's terrible in an interesting or fascinating way, I can paint a clear picture in my head of what the review will look like, but when a game is just a bit whatever, I always find myself emptily staring at that blinking line on a blank page telling me to write something. As a general rule, I simply don't review bland games. 007 Bloodstone, at least according to my hazy memories of it, was a bland game, because in a lot of ways it's the most derivative 2010 game ever. There's cover shooting with simple stealth mechanics like Uncharted, single button takedowns and a mark and execute system like the latest Splinter Cell games, and even detective vision like the Arkham games, with the excuse that it's Bond using his mobile phone. If that wasn't enough, there's also a completely tacked on flavorless multiplayer and a forgettable save the world story just to hammer it all home. If you're looking for something inventive, this is absolutely not the game for you. But just because it's not inventive doesn't doesn't mean it's not impressive, and I'm actually really glad that I returned to Bloodstone. So going back a bit, last year I made a Quantum of Solace video where I talked to the game's developers from Treyarch who shared that it was a complete disaster of a production behind the scenes, and having released the very successful World at War at the same time, Treyarch got sucked into the Call of Duty machine from then on. From one subsidiary to another, Activision put the UK-based Bizarre Creations on the job for the next Bond game, who were mostly known for their races with the Project Gotham series, but they had some shooter experience in the past with the club in 2008, which shares the same proprietary engine and lead designer as Bloodstone. Part of the reason development on Quantum was so messy was because working with the Bond license holders, especially during the tumultuous production of the film, proved very challenging, so it only made sense to work with an original story here and not tie it into any film. And Thank God that they did, because the film which turned out to be Skyfall was put on hold in 2010 as Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, the Lion logo studio behind it, filed for bankruptcy just before this game came out. Despite those financial troubles, Bloodstone feels far from cheap, with the first level showcasing some really impressive water reflections and explosions and shaders and particle effects and physics objects and dynamic lighting, all while running at a consistent 30 on both PS3 and 360, or 60 on PC. You're looking at the PS3 version. Bizarre's in-house engine really holds up here, weird looking character models aside, and looking at it from other perspectives, this is a very strong breakneck opening which sees you in Athens shooting your way through a yacht, racing a speedboat in a gorgeous highly scripted sequence, shooting your way through a mansion, and then getting in a chase in an Aston Martin all in about 15 minutes. It, it, it's, it's hard to even think about the mechanics while you're moving forward so quickly and gawking at all the set pieces. And if it wasn't feeling expensive enough, Craig and Dench return to voice Bond and M, and Joss Stone sets the stage with a surprisingly good Bond song. It's all very sleek, which is why it's so disappointing that the next location in Istanbul is long, slow, and takes place in construction sites and cisterns, wasting the potential with Istanbul's wonderful historic architecture. The high octane pace of the first 15 minutes was never going to be maintained, and I, I, I doubt you'd even want it to be, but to rein it all the way back to dull grey browns and what's basically an overlong sewer level puts Bloodstone right in that bland territory, with some lifeless detective vision find the objective bits and lots of line of sight stealth. It's especially sad as the real life cisterns this section is based on are gorgeously lit up, and I'd have liked to see this engine recreate that look with the reflections rather than this washed out look. Not even the spectacle of a giant drill can save this bit, and this is where I originally stopped playing Bloodstone back in the day, because it just didn't seem promising enough to continue with, which is why it left the impression that it did. But that turned out to be a mistake, as the next level in Monaco is exactly what should have been this game's second level. A tux-wearing Bond infiltrates a classy casino, quietly taking out bad guys and gathering intel, while the party goes on on the floors below. Bloodstone's gameplay has this chameleon-like quality where it's only as entertaining as the level surrounding it. It controls very smoothly with virtually faultless cover mechanics and cover switching, and it has a low time to kill even on higher difficulties which makes it feel snappy and stylish, which is helped by the smooth and responsive animation. Doing a takedown to earn a free headshot can make for some fun strung together firefights, and even holding down a button to collect intel with the mobile phone is cool and fun when it's hacking people's phones in their pockets at a classy casino. But the thing is, these are essentially the same gameplay loops that were in Istanbul, and there I was wondering why I couldn't throw grenades but the enemies can, or why there's basically no enemy variety. When a level is good, the gameplay feels seamless, and when it's bad, it feels, and I'm gonna use this same word again, 
bland. How enjoyable Bloodstone is, is directly tied to the level design, the pace, and as superficial as this may sound, the aesthetic, because the gameplay is so simple that it needs to be supported elsewhere. As a Bond nerd, it's always cool to see Bonds doing Bondy things in a tux at a classy establishment, especially when it's stealthy. Uh, just a tip, if you do play this yourself, play it on a harder difficulty just so it actually punishes you when you get caught sneaking, giving it some risk reward factor. No level captures this bipolar nature to the game better than the next, where you infiltrate a Siberian chemical plant. I love how much care has gone into the brutalist architecture here with the towering concrete and the impressive interiors to match. It's novel to see this love just put into the visual design, like this concrete spiral staircase with long hanging lamp shaded lights, or even something more subtle like the way these computer desks and shelves sit in the wall under these curved wooden slats and down lights. Even something as simple as a hallway is spruced up enough to make it seem thoughtful and realistic. It's, it's just the kind of thing that you don't consciously notice without paying attention to it, but your subconscious appreciates it, and this level of detail and quality is strewn throughout the game. I also love how in these early sections in Siberia, Bond jumps between jogging with his weapons concealed in public spaces and going in full combat mode in staff only places. Uh, specifically, there's this wonderful part where you go from walking around past guards and workers and civilians unassumingly to going outside and shooting a handful of guards down and then re-entering another building, seeing Bond casually fix his posture and put his weapon away, and then walking by more civilians like nothing just happened. It's really cool and it feels very Bond, if only he fixed his cuffs and tie as he walked in. Unfortunately, Siberia then devolves into a long chunk of boring industrial area waist high cover shootouts pretty quickly where, like in Istanbul, it just doesn't feel Bondian at all. But eventually, after slogging through some fetch quest tier content, we're treated to another Aston Martin driving mission. Uh, I've neglected to properly talk about it until now, but these driving missions are incredible. They're very, very linear spectacles, almost like a theme park ride, and they don't have any gadgets or car combat, which I was initially disappointed by because I liked how the drive was done in previous Bond games like Everything or Nothing and Nightfire, but Bizarre go for something else here. Like the rest of the game, mechanically these sections are very simple, but they're balanced around that. They're very high speed, so you need to make quick decisions, and you will need to use the brakes or you will crash and fail. This makes them about as intense to play as they are to look at, and you don't really have any chances to appreciate the Michael Bay-esque explosive production because you're focusing so much on the road. With it all going on in your peripheral vision, it makes it that much more more exciting to play. I don't think that there's any game that's done driving missions quite like this or to this visceral effect, and visually they haven't aged a day. They're only 5 to 15 minutes each, and there's only a handful of them total, but they're a huge standout, and even Istanbul has a DB5 section spliced in that is equally wonderful as it actually does show off the city. Speaking of Michael Bay, Siberia ends strong, with a giant hovercraft scene where you shoot missiles out of the sky and jump on the wing of a ridiculous looking military seaplane. It's amazing. We're then treated to the best location in the entire game with Bangkok. It's not only the best because it has a breakneck pace through these exotic streets and rooftops, and not only because it opens in an aquarium with great ambience and visual design, but also because the story, which hasn't been worth talking about so far, finally begins to get going. The UK's top secret biochemical project has fallen into enemy hands. Only one man can unravel the sinister goal and defeat those behind it. Good morning. My name's Bond. James Bond. The story so far has been a standard spy story excuse to travel. Go here, find out this, do this. Too much of it is told through loading screens just like in Quantum, and the only real character to it that we're afforded is through this game's Bond girl, Nicole Hunter, voiced by Joss Stone, who also sang the theme song, which is pretty interesting. Uh, she's an MI6 agent who, let's just say, is more of a Sean Connery Bond girl than a Daniel Craig one. Would you like to drive? I feel much safer with a man behind the wheel. Finally, in Bangkok, the story gets personal. Bond meets with a Chinese informant in the aquarium who gets assassinated after revealing the bad guy behind it all is a guy named Rack. After chasing the assassin through many a shootout, we're treated to the silliest, most Michael Bay car chase of them all. Or should I say, giant tipper truck chase. Can you just imagine how historic an event it would be if this chase actually happened? Like, this thing destroys the city like it's nothing. It's incredible. You just can't help but love it. Even if it is a bit die another day, and this is another superficial thing, but it's impressive how much of the city that they've modelled here. 
The assassin gets away, so Bond talks to a nightclub owner to ask where Rack is. This guy does tell Bond, but then he betrays Bond by letting Rack know that Bond is coming. Uh, finally, when you do find Rack, Bond gets captured, thrown in a Burmese prison, and threatened by Rack with a well-acted villain speech. You talk, Mr. Bond. You give up your secrets. Sooner or later, they all do. Effectively, this entire Bangkok section does a great job at setting up the game's villain as a powerful and threatening figure. He killed the informant, he has power over the nightclub owner, and even Bond can't best him. The problem is, it took almost until the end of the game for this setup to happen, or for even a clear villain to be part of the picture. Had Rack been established in a similar way in Athens or Istanbul and been ever present throughout the rest of the game, it would have given me something of an emotional investment that had helped me carry through the otherwise boring parts. Like with the next section set in Myanmar or Burma, the game uses Burma, the first half is just completely boring military camp stuff, about as dry as it gets, but at least I want to break out of this camp and take down Rack. You stumble upon a very over-engineered dam to shoot your way through, the difficulty spikes because it's the end of the game, and you take down Rack in what was another example of this game flip-flopping into boring territory again. The gameplay loop is pretty tired by this point, even if it's only been 5 or 6 hours. Finally, we have the most poorly communicated twist ever. So Joss Stone's Nicole character publicly is a famous jewellery designer, but you find this out in a throwaway line near the start of the game that's completely blink and you miss it. Nicole Hunter, you're the jewellery designer. I've been called worse. Fast forward to Rack talking about his fancy knife in his villain speech, you're meant to remember the knife even though you never get a clear look at it. And then after you beat Rack, a cutscene plays where Nicole receives the knife in the mail. The insinuation is that Nicole made the knife for Rack so she's a double agent, but man, even if you paid enough attention to know everything you need to know for this twist, it's just not enough to really put together what the game is trying to say. You never even see the knife come into Bond's possession. Uh, a lot of the emotion the story is carrying with the rack thing is just completely deflated because of the sheer confusion here. I tried searching through the game's collectible intel files for more info on this, but just came up with nothing. That said, at least we get another fun driving mission chasing Nicole in Monaco that's very subdued compared to the others. No explosions, just nice views. Once you catch Nicole, she says that there's a bigger villain behind everything who's scary and powerful, sounding a lot like Spectre, but before she can share who it is, she gets killed by a drone. Cliffhanger, James Bond will return, credits roll. James Bond did not return, at least not to finish this story off, and we never even found out what the Bloodstone actually is. Is it a vague reference to Nicole being an immoral jewellery maker? Is it because she's played by Joss Stone, so it's like Bloodstone, Joss Stone? Or is it the stone in the hilt of Rack's knife that you see very, very briefly? Was it the friends that we made along the way? Uh, I sent out messages to developers trying to find out what it actually is, to no response. This will forever be a mystery, I guess. Uh, if, if, if I do get a response, I'll pin it in the comments. On balance, though Bloodstone does sort of follow a sine wave of quality, is it overall worth playing? Well, say that you do have a sine wave. At its peak, the game is fun, and down the bottom of those valleys, it's bland. Uh, the highs are much stronger than the lows, and take up significantly more of the game than the lows too, so let's redraw the wave like this with smaller valleys. Uh, then the switch between the quality and bland moments is often very sudden, so it actually looks more like this. This. And over time, the levels generally get better with Bangkok and Siberia being highlights and with the story showing glimpses of life, so it actually looks more like this. Uh, finally, the handful of short racing missions are simply sublime, so our theoretical enjoyment curve for Bloodstone ends up looking like this, with spikes for each driving section. And just looking at this totally objective, completely professional way of analysing a video game, you can probably tell that Bloodstone was absolutely worth playing for me, but it just doesn't quite tip over into that great territory. Uh, remove the valleys, shorten it from a 6 hour game to a 4 hour game if you have to, and Bloodstone becomes a quintessential essential 7th gen cover shooter. As it stands, I think that time has served this game well, and not just visually. Now that we're mostly on the other side of the Gears of War Uncharted era of shooters and have that perspective of looking back on them, Bloodstone's smooth controls, production value, short length, and quick time to kill serve it well. If you want to return to a 7th gen cover shooter that's consumable, explosive, and instantly familiar, I can't recommend Bloodstone more, especially if you're a Bond fan. So why did James Bond not 
return. Well, sadly, this was Bizarre's final game, as Activision tried to sell them off after this and their underrated racing game Blur both underperformed, and they found no buyer. Ex-employees have since blamed Activision for the closure, as you'd expect they were meddling with the creative process, and as one employee notes, we weren't an independent studio making our games anymore, we were making games to fill slots. Although we did believe in them, they were more the products of committees and analysts. You can absolutely see this with how mechanically generic Bloodstone is. Batman games are big, so put Detective Vision in your game. It's sad that it didn't sell well, but it's not too surprising as it didn't review super well, it's short, and it released right in the middle of 2010's holiday season. Just like how World at War came out only a week after Quantum, Black Ops came out a week after this. Activision really didn't time these games well. Oh, and the GoldenEye Wii remake released on the same day as this, just to rub it all in. You'd think that Bizarre's closure would be the reason that Bloodstone never got a sequel, but that's actually not the case. Bizarre was never even set to develop a sequel. Uh, Activision put Raven Software on the job, the gang behind Soldier of Fortune and Singularity and X-Men Origins Wolverine. They were a great dev back then, and it would have been nice to see them tackle James Bond. Their game was going to be called James Bond 007 Risico, and it was never formally announced and not a lot is known about it, but in 2012 we got to see some leaks from it with some animation tests and even video of a near completed level. It looks expectedly similar, though it appears to be running on a different engine. The hand to hand was being expanded beyond single button takedowns to having sort of a blocking system, but it still looks very safe mechanically. James Bond Risico is also the name of a 1960 Ian Fleming short story, and the theory is is that this game would have followed that story to some extent while tying up Bloodstone's loose ends. Uh, a few unconfirmable sources online claim that Risico was cancelled because Bloodstone was delayed from 2009 to 2010, but there's no evidence of Bloodstone's delay anywhere else, and I'd bet on it being canned simply because of Bloodstone's poor performance. At least Spectre unintentionally tied up Bloodstone, I guess. Uh, sadly, like Treyarch, Raven since got sucked into the Call of Duty machine. And that's the story of 007 Bloodstone. A great four hour game stretched into six hours, an ending that was never followed up on, and an ill-fated developer screwed over by a giant publisher. The final two Daniel Craig Bond games form with the GoldenEye remake and 007 Legends, both of which were made by Eurocom, and both of which I'll be reviewing. Continuing Activision's track record with these, I'm sure you can guess what happened to Eurocom afterwards. And with that, we wrap up the video. Um, it's kind of a crazy time in the world right now, as you all know. Hope you've been nice to yourselves and nice to each other, and you've been staying inside and taking it easy. It's all a bit scary. I, ho I hope this video served as some sort of escapism for you. Um, but yeah, I, I just want to take this final final section of the video to thank my patrons. So thank you to my patrons, including the ones coming up on the screen, and especially including my $5 patrons, Adam Beals, Analog Man, Anthony Heisel, BC's Gaming Shelf, Blake Barnett, Boggy Online, Caden the Dingo, Devin Grandal, Dominic Chikoki, Gary Pay, James Lock the Large, James Lock the Large, Casey, Kayla, Labcat, Lachlan Jones, Lucas Racevic, Maximilian Kunzman, May Arise, Mazaki, Melanie G, Minimi Always Talks About Minimi in Third Person, Person, Mustache Duct Tape, Peaceful Kumquat, Plague, Riddlin' for Kids, Skied Panthera, Taylor Shedden, Tia, Test Drive Unlimited 2, The Last Great Opium Den, Op Opi <laughs> The Last Great Opium Den, The Mighty Mega Link, Thomas Damsgaard, TJ, Traplor Ross, Travis, Trevor Corbin, Under 10 Hours, Who Walks with Fergus, Riding on Games, and Zindictive. Thank you all for watching. Hope you've been well, and uh, yeah, see you in the next video. Take it easy. Bye.